This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. It's episode 295 of the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm Jamie Bogner. Joining me remote from Des Moines, Iowa, the team from Barntown Brewing, Pete Faber, Grant Brower, Cody Geyer. Did I get all those names right? Sure did. You know, we just finished up the IPA issue of the magazine. And uh, interestingly enough, I, I don't want to, sp- I've already spoiled things for you guys. Last year in our IPA issue, you scored a 98 with your neon hazy IPA. This year in the forthcoming IPA issue, your double IPA stink, stink, stunk also was the top score in the double IPA category with another 98. And so I got to thinking, I wonder what these guys are doing at this, uh, you know, out there in Des Moines, Iowa, making such high quality hazy IPA. And so I reached out and here we are having this conversation. Now we're going to talk about all that. And I should also say you're coasted pretty well too with uh with a score of 92 in this forthcoming issue um making some great beers you know both uh, you know across those ale styles um you know and uh we're going to tap into how it is you're doing those things how you're finding those ways to make uh, uh creative and compelling beers that uh, that certainly are resonating consistently with our blind judges um and then we're going to talk about some other brewing uh you know process you guys are involved in too before we do that gnd chillers the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling are proud of the cool partnerships they've built over the past 30 years. GD Chillers has set the standard on quality, service, and reliability with 24-7 service and support. Want to maximize efficiency in your chiller? GD's micro channel condensers are designed for less power draw. Their lighter weight, more compact design uses up to 70% less refrigerant, which means a lower GWP and lower operating costs. Reach out for a quote today at gdchillers.com or call to discuss your next project. Also, this episode is brought to you by BSG Distributors of TNS Hop Oils. Looking for a way to save on freight, reduce waste, all while improving beer quality, then change your brewing game with TNS Hop Oils. Visit bsgcraftbrewing.com to learn how TNS Hop Oils can make your beer and your margins better. And is your brewery making its own ciders, seltzers, and other beverages beyond beer? If you need a central source for fruit flavor, Old Orchard has you covered. Old Orchard supplies flavored craft juice concentrate blends to beverage brands for the production of beer, cider, seltzer, wine, spirits, kombucha, and more. Flavor your lineup and streamline your sourcing by heading to oldorchard.com slash brewer. We should probably do a little bit of audio intro first. Um, why don't we start with Cody so people can follow your voice along on this one. Cody? What's up? Grant, you're head brewer for uh, for Barntown. How's it going? And then Pete, you're the founder and uh, you know primary operator. Yes, sir. Well, why don't we why don't we start off with you, Pete? Why don't you give us a little background on Barntown? My background was uh, bar and restaurant. Um, I spent 16 years in Chicago and um, <clears throat> was a buyer for four different bars and restaurants that I owned, and then just got really tight with the the uh, community there, and then. Uh, just realized that I wanted to come back home to Des Moines. Um, Chicago was getting a little tougher to get around and having kids and just wanted something a little simple. And um, knowing that um, Des Moines just really didn't have that many breweries like Chicago did. So I just looked at it as an opportunity to come home and then do something, you know, which I thought would be cool for the, for the city. So that was the opportunity. So uh, packed it up and, um, got out of my bars that I was a part of and then um, just kind of looked all over and kind of settled out in the suburbs and um, kind of the rest has been history. We just uh, had our six year anniversary a couple of weeks ago. What, what point did uh, you know uh, Grant get involved in this? Grant's been here since day one. Um, we uh, I, I interviewed quite a few people and um, he was doing production work for um, the Granite City company that did, uh, he was doing the war production for all of them here at, out in Ames. So he was about 30 minutes away and we met quite a few times and kind of talked about the things that I wanted to do and, and his, uh, um, history in, in brewing. And he also worked in the restaurant industry, uh, industry as well. So it was kind of nice to have both of those backgrounds and kind of understand what we want to do from a food perspective and also from a brewing perspective. 
And so we kind of hit it off and um, kind of got going from from the get go. Grant, uh, you know, how did you guys, as you started envisioning this beer program for Barntown, uh, you know, how did you you know start to uh, um, to shape that? You know, what was it that drove? Like, how did you decide what you're going to make and uh, you know what you guys were going to put your energy behind? Um, we typically have just been making beers that we get excited about, and then hopefully other people get excited about as well. Um, you know, we make beers that that are mostly like one-off productions. We have a, kind of a standard core, but we're pretty well known for making a lot of different styles and a lot of different beers and basically being able to do a variety of things I think is better for the customer and more exciting for us too. And this is just primarily taproom focused or, uh, you know, how much is, you know, how's that balance between uh, taproom uh, which is brew pub and, uh, you know, and kind of distribution beer? We focus a lot on our tap room, but we also do a lot of package product to go from the tap room, and then we mm-hmm. do distro. So we're we're probably maybe about fifty fifty right now on tap room and distribution sales. That makes sense. So when you say you know you you want to you brew a lot of one offs and a lot of special beers, definitely there's some veins in there. You know some stuff that uh, that you hit with that uh, you know the customers you know. That started resonating with customers early on, which you guys have leaned into. What does that look like now in terms of uh, you know the overall beer program? Our our sours are probably our bigger sellers right now, um, but I would say our IPAs are pretty high up there as well. Um, early on, for sure, IPAs. I mean, it's everybody's story, right? It's 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 craft beer in America. Then it's it's IPA. It's something like forty five ish percent uh you know of the entire craft beer market on that it's interesting though that uh, like the fruited sour beers are such a such a big thing for you all yeah we definitely wanted to give a different experience for the guests anytime that they came in so we have a lot of regulars and um it's been nice to be able to give them a different experience every time they come in the door so it's it's been definitely something that we, we decided early on to do, and we're also kind of doing a little of that with our food as well. So just same four walls, different experience every week, and people are enjoying it. So how do you then put a framework around that? What is, uh, what's that process of creating new beers look like for you guys? We can say we just make a whole bunch of beers, but designing a bunch of new beers all the time, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of creative work, and figuring out how to do that well is also hard. Um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, some of that kind of creative process, where the ideas come from, how you guys develop ideas around those things. I mean, I think we, we get together a lot. We, we, we meet and hang out, <clears throat> hang out quite often. And a lot of the inspirations come from food, um, come from different just experiences that we've had, um, whether we're out of town eating some food uh, or just something that we like is uh, some sweets or, or dessert type things. Um, so we kind of get together and we talk about, well, what'd you have that you liked that maybe we can make a beer out of. And that's kind of usually where it starts. And then these guys kind of take it from there. So you have a kind of creative, uh, head to head and then, uh, and then kind of go off on a development process. What's that development you know process typically look like for you guys? You know, how do you then hone those ideas into what, you know, good beers? Cause Again, there's a lot of, especially if you're talking about fruited, uh, you know, tart and sour beers, there's a lot of, a lot of different ways to, a lot of ingredients you can pull on, a lot of different ways to make those kinds of things. How do you go, th- you know, through that development process from that point? Uh, some of that's just past history on prior batches that we've made of just different things. And that's all the way through from IPAs to sours to stouts to everything. Um, you know, you... You hit some flavor note on accident because you had something in there and like maybe it doesn't work for that beer. Uh, and then you want to maybe extenuate that for like get that pop in for another beer. And so kind of, you know, hit and hit and miss. Uh, we kind of found some, you know, some good ingredients, um, you know, good hops, uh, getting the right blend of of you know grains uh, to to make the the body and you know mash and right to get get kind of our final gravities on our IPAs where we want them and it's kind of a balance game on a lot of that stuff is and 
you know, every year it seems the market, what they want changes. And so we try to evolve what we've made in the past to try to update it to what they want. Sometimes, you know, it tends to be a little bit sweeter in most of the styles now than where it was in the past, you know, five years ago, you know, if we were making some of these beers, uh, people would be like, it's way too sweet. And now we get some people that are like, oh, it's too dry. I can't, you know, I want it sweeter. How much sweeter are we talking about than over the last five years in terms of where you're finishing? Where do you finish now versus where you would have finished the, you know, five years ago? Well, it's for our IPAs, uh, probably five years ago, they were probably finishing around three and a half, four Play-Doh. And now we're, we're trying to get those at four and a half, five Play-Doh. So not a whole yeah. lot with the IPAs, but definitely with the sours, the sweetness has definitely jumped up. And that's probably what, seven, seven percent sweetness on those are uh higher abv ipa so i've been quite a bit higher though we've hit some really high numbers with some of those as far as sweetness we've had them up to like nine play-doh sometimes it's a it's a funny strange uh, phenomenon to watch that and uh, you know while at the same time you know we are also you you see the exact opposite of that also happening within you know with customers also find, being attracted to to lager and drier beers um you know and the sweet things are getting sweeter and the dry things are getting drier um and it's not necessarily the same thing moving in both of those ways well let's i want to talk about ipa and uh you know how you then set about to formulate this because uh you know interestingly enough like there's a lot of great hazy IPA makers in Iowa, one very large brewery that's putting their hazy IPA uh, and hazy pale ales out uh, on a very wide footprint across the country. Uh, you know, and so the audience in Iowa is used to good, well-made hazy IPA and they have high expectations about that. And, and obviously you guys are uh, bringing this in a uh, interesting and compelling way. So I want to talk about how you all formulate that beer for you all. Before we do that, AccuBrew announces the addition of specific gravity to their suite of brewing tools. AccuBrew is a revolutionary fermentation monitoring system. Their mobile app and stainless steel CIP ready sensor work together to predict specific gravity every 15 minutes. Detect problems before they ruin the batch, share data, make notes, control access, and schedule reminders anywhere, anytime. AccuBrew is your set it and forget it solution to tracking every batch. No more samples, no calibration, and virtually no maintenance. Join the AccuBrew community today and experience 24-7 peace of mind. Visit with the developers at booth 2935 at the 2023 CBC Brew Expo America. Also, ProBrew has always been a dedicated and trusted partner to breweries, especially when they make the leap to canning their product. That's why they only sell rotary can fillers, which significantly reduce product waste and produce higher quality product than an inline can filler. Need proof? Visit ProBrew at booth 433, as well as at their party at Yazoo Brewing at this year's Craft Brewers Conference in Nashville. To RSVP to their event or schedule time with them at the show, visit them at ProBrew.com slash CBC or email contact us at probrew.com, probrew, brew your beer. So let's talk about designing Hazy IPA. Obviously, you know, I'm sure, yeah, as you mentioned, things have changed over time. As you guys got started, uh, you know, and, and as you've now, you know, look at it, um, you know, what what did you guys set out as some fundamental tenets of the, the way that you brew Hazy IPA? You know, how did you decide to do it and what does it look like now? Uh, you know, and maybe we'll start with a beer like, neon looking at a single hazy ipa uh you know what does that look like from a from a beer design process and maybe we'll start talking about malt uh we've had kind of a, a generic uh mix of wheat to oats and pilsner malt that has really worked well um for a lot of ipas and so you know if we're going up to you know, a real high gravity. Um, sometimes the percentages we kind of tweak a little bit, but um, you know, we can kind of you know like hit the ABV we want for the the, the beer we're making. And um, it took us a little while to kind of get that that right blend that we like. Um, but I think we've got a, a a pretty decent blend. But we typically use uh, malted oats and uh, white wheat, and then uh, Pilsner malt on a lot of the IPAs. Um, is there a specific Pilsner malt that you guys, you know, are attracted to? Um, the Pilsner malt we predominantly use is the the RAR 
um, Pilsner. Um, we really like it. It's it's got a lot of those traditional Pilsner notes. Um, we've used a lot of other Pilsner malts, and we'll switch here and there. Um, but that's been a pretty good workhorse for us, um, and so we've been kind of sticking with that. Um, but we've used a lot of other products throughout the years. Um, that's just the kind of one we fell into is our kind of standard. To... Sure, sure. Now, why blend uh, you know oats and wheat in this process? Uh, you know, oftentimes brewers I talk to will choose one or the other just out of you know kind of simplicity. And what do you find out of a blend of those two? We use quite a bit more wheat than oats. I wouldn't say our oat usage is is heavy by any means, um, but we do use the the malted oats, and those have given us, I think, a much more stable uh, product for the most part. Um, uh, we get, I think, we get a little less of that. I don't know hot burn. I think when we use less of the oats and more wheat. Um, and the malted oats seem to help with that a little bit too. The burn, what do you mean by that? Um, just kind of that, that resiny green notes that don't seem to settle out sometimes, you know, you're just kind of waiting for them and you're just dropping as much of the hops out as you can. And, uh, when we go real high in, in, in oats, it seems to take a little bit longer, a little bit more protein maybe. Interesting. So it's, it's grabbing onto some of those compounds and holding them more in suspension, whereas if you're using a higher percentage of wheat that seems to clean up a little bit faster? Uh, yeah, it seems to be a little bit better, but we still like a little bit of the mouthfeel of the oats, and, and so yeah. we've got it to a level where we're, we're pretty happy with where we're at the for the rough, percentage. Rough percentages for those kinds of things? or um, So we're typically... I just didn't, uh, typically about six to seven percent, actually, no, sorry, six to eight percent on the oats. And then the wheat's kind of in that 24 to 28 percent mark. That's, that's a significant amount of, of wheat in this overall recipe and really a significant amount of non-barley grain to, you know, at this point, given where people are. At one point, that might not have been as significant. Mm -hmm. These days, it seems like a lot of folks have reduced some of those uh, non-barley components in their hazy IPAs just for simplicity and the kind of straightforward production element. But that, that that's a it's a lot of non-barley grain in these recipes now. Uh, yeah, I would say it's it might be a little bit high, um, but I don't know. We just kind of fell into kind of that those amounts is kind of a, a good base. And for, I will say for about every IPA, we do kind of go different routes and kind of see how it works and we continually play with it. You know, a year from now, it'll be completely different on some of these beers. It's always the hard thing about having these conversations because this is just a snapshot in time and, uh, you know, things will keep moving in different directions. Are there, is there, are there specific, uh, you know, wheat and uh, malted oats that you, uh, that you really love when you're making these things? Um, we've been using the raw malted oats for the most part, yeah. but Simpsons also has a really solid product. And so we've been getting that as well. Um, as far as wheat, I'm not a huge, like they all are pretty close to the same to me, to be honest. Let's talk about water for a little bit. You know, obviously when you're trying to achieve this kind of, you know, soft mouthfeel in a, in a hazy IPA in particular, uh, you know, getting that water dialed in tends to be a, a pretty important piece of it. How do you, how do you all go about that? Uh, um, you know, I don't know what your water is like, uh, where you, where you're pulling it from, but how, you know, what do you try to, you know, build in terms of, a, a you know, baseline water profile for hazy IPA? So we try to do like a three to one chloride to sulfate ratio. Uh, we usually send a water test in quarterly and get it checked out. Uh, it's, it's usually pretty similar. There's small changes here and there, but yeah, that's what we're really shooting for is that three to one chloride to sulfate, which is kind of the industry standard, I think. Um, and when your water is pretty, you know, do you, do you have to strip anything out before you build it back up or? Uh, it has a small filtration that it goes through, it goes through a water softener, but other than that, no, not really. Cool. Cool. Well, let's talk about hops. Uh, like most brewers, I suspect you, you have some core things that, that work and then you, find ways to, you know, manip manipulate some more, uh, some smaller variables along the way to make sure that you're still going to come across, you know, get something that you like out of us. Um, you know, how do you, how do you then think about building, uh, uh, hop combos 
for hazy IPA? Are there some, is there a go-to base that you use? And then, uh, you know, how do you uh, develop out from there? We kind of have a baseline for how, like our hop load that we're putting in the Whirlpool. As for like selection, we have quite a bit of hop inventory in our warehouse. We're just trying to pick from that. But you always try to pick uh, like a banger hop. You know, you always want to throw in something that people get excited about, whether that's citra, mosaic, something like that to help round it out. Uh, as Pete calls it, the bacon. The citra calls it the bacon. It's good with everything. The bacon. I like it. I like it. How do you then build out from there? Uh, we kind of usually sit down uh, in our like meetings and kind of pick out usually at least three hops when we're making like a newer IPA. Um, yeah. And, uh, and then me and Cody kind of get together later and kind of start figuring out the amounts. Um, we don't like to leave any open bags of hops. So we, we try to make, we're, make sure we're using the amount of hops that'll, that'll kill full bags. Um, um, with us being a little bit smaller, we have to kind of, you know, pick and choose on, on, on full bag amounts, but usually we just kind of, you know, if it's the recipe calls for maybe half a bag, or if we build it to like half a bag, we'll, you know, finish out to one more bag or, or whatever. So we're not leaving any open bags. Um, but yeah, then we just kind of, you know, use our, what we like and what's worked well. Um, you know, some hops use too much of them. They kind of take over. And, and so that's kind of when we're in our meeting, we kind of, you know, kind of think about what flavor profile we want to kind of hit with that. And then me and Cody kind of get together later and, and figure out the amounts to try to hit those marks. That's interesting. So, you know, as you think about that the initial meeting, you're involved in this, Pete, and, uh, you know, even though you're not a brewer per se, um, you're still involved in these conversations about what you're going to make next and talking about flavor and hitting these kinds of ideas. And it starts with some sort of language around what you all want to you know, try to hit with something like this. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, whether it's something that, um, we've tried, um, that someone else has made or if it's a, a hop we've never tried before, um, we'll, we'll get our hands on that or, or if like, I, like you said, um, citrus seems to be something that people gravitate toward ever since, I think since, uh, probably zombie dust and, and that's just been worked so well. So, um, like they said, we kind of use that for a base and then kind of go from there. Um, if there's something that we haven't tried that we're interested, we'll, we'll give it a shot. And, you know, if it works out well, then maybe we'll pump that up for the next beer that, you know, we want to give maybe a little bit more than, uh, the last try. You, you mentioned Whirlpool edition, you know, I imagine on the hot side that it's all Whirlpool edition there. And how do you, how do you tend to like, uh, from a technical perspective split between Whirlpool and, and dry hop, you know, for a total hop load. So for our total hop load, it's mostly in the dry hop. Our Whirlpool unfortunately can't handle a large edition. So in the Whirlpool, it's probably only like five pounds for a, a 10 barrel batch. Uh, yeah. And then the rest is all dry hop and a dry hop is usually three and a half to four pounds per barrel on a bigger it's, beer. Uh, we'll up that, but for our, uh, like our neon, it's, it's like three and a half, four pounds per barrel. How do you then, uh, you know, think about bitterness in this because, you know, with so little going in on hot side, you know, you're still getting bitterness out of this, but it becomes harder to, you know, kind of nail how you're getting that bitterness. And I imagine some of that can change depending on the hop variety that you're using. You know, how do you then kind of, you know, envision the balance on this uh, with so much going in through dry hop? Uh, we do try to chill down our, our whirlpool so that we're not picking up as much bitterness. Um, and that's something that I think um, we've been doing that for quite a while, but that's really helped. Um, and uh, then also doing hop drops earlier uh, uh, seems to have been helping pretty good for us too. How far do you bring things down and, uh, you know, how long does a whirlpool, you know, uh, how long does that process then? So we just run it right through the heat exchanger, cool it down to about 180, uh, yeah. and throw them right in the whirlpool, whirlpool for about 10, 15 minutes and let it settle. Uh, yeah. Usually while we're whirlpooling, we're, uh, we're mashing in the next batch, running it over. So they set in there however long it takes before we can get back to using cold water because we had to share water in, in our brewery. 
So they yeah. sit in the whirlpool until we can get cold water and then we knock it out. Do you find that different hops, you know, perform in different ways there, uh, you know, b- between that kind of hot side whirlpool, you know, are there some that you definitely kind of push towards the whirlpool or there's some that you push then, you know, towards, uh, towards the dry hop, not, uh, you know, throwing in that whirlpool. We use a lot of Citra in our whirlpool, uh, a lot of Idaho seven. Um, those are the two big ones that we use the most of. Um, I think it was YCH released that thing about survivables that they had. And I know Idaho seven was way up there on the list. So we, so we tend to use a lot of that in our whirlpool. When it comes to let's maybe talk about dry hopping. Then, when it comes to dry hopping, how, what's your process look like for dry hopping on these? So, for dry hopping on our IPAs, um, after fermentation is over, we don't do any active fermentation dry hopping. It's all post fermentation. Uh, we crash it to thirty eight degrees. Why? Why? You know, uh, we you used just to do found any benefit from it? Right. We used to do it, um, and it. it it, we really didn't see any difference to what we're doing now. Uh, it also helps us with harvesting yeast. We don't have to worry about that being in there and playing that game. We can wait till it's done, crash the tank, harvest the yeast, and then dry hop it. That yeast is, is good to go. That way we don't have to worry, worry about it having the, the dry hop in there. Uh, that's the big reason why we do it that way. Uh, and the reason we crashed it to 38 degrees before we dry hop, one, to harvest yeast, and uh, also because... Uh, studies have shown that you can still get all the extraction that you need at that temperature and some of the other stuff that you don't want to extract won't extract at those colder temperatures like the myrcene that makes it taste maybe kind of a little astringent a little bitey Uh, we also do a research on our dry hop for about maybe an hour or two nothing big and we're shooting co2 up every once in a while while we're researching just to kind of rouse those hops Um, that's another thing that's changed throughout the years we've done dry hopping numerous different ways uh sure. but that seems to work the best for us now so that's what we've been doing how long uh you know is that overall dry hop uh sit for uh it sits for maybe three days and then we do a drop out of the bottom just dump that out of the cone so it sits for three days you're only recirking for a couple hours you know tops through that um you know do you recirc at the start or at the end uh you know and then and how do you really, you know, get those hops to, to mix into the tank? So I get the research going right away before I've added any hops. Uh, I have a little doser that snaps onto the top of the tank. Uh, right. It holds 11 pounds. You can purge it. It's so You keep your tank under pressure so we don't have to worry about the beer shooting out or, or DO or anything like that. It's all sealed. Uh, so it drops in while it's researching, and I just keep loading it until we get all the hops in there. As it's recirking, um, shooting CO2 up through the bottom of the tank, because if you dump a bunch of hops into the top of the tank, they're just going to sit there right, in a pile. Right. They don't drop. So that rousing of the tank helps helps those hops drop. The pump kind of chews them up, breaks them up, gets them into solution. You know, I, I think we've got a little bit more to talk about on IPA before we switch gears and talk about uh, uh, fruited sour beer. Before we do that, from the rotatable pickup tube on Rogue Brewing's Pilot Brew House to the integrated hop backs on Sierra Nevada's twin prototyping brew houses. SS Brewtech has taken technology they invented, working with world-renowned industry veterans, and made them available to every craft brewer. To learn more about SS Brewtech's innovation list, head on over to ssbrewtech.com. Also, 100% recycled, 100% recyclable, and reusable, PackTech handles are the sustainable solution to handle your craft beer. PackTech has been a leading producer of secondary packaging for the craft beer industry for over 30 years and their handles are found across the globe. By fully embracing the principles of circular economy, PacTech helps customers meet their own ambitious, sustainable goals. 100% recycled, 100% recyclable, and reusable, PacTech is the sustainable packaging solution for your craft beer. Order your free samples today. Call 541-461-5000. That's 541-461-5000. And Berkeley Yeast, the creators of Tropics Yeast, which produces massive notes of guava and passion fruit, now bring you Thiol Boost. Berkeley Yeast's Thiol Boost is pure liquid thiol precursors that take Tropics to the next level. Add it to the fermenter when you pitch the yeast and prepare yourself for tropical fruit nirvana. The concentration of precursors is the same in every batch of Thiol Boost so you can predictably tune the level of tropical flavor by adjusting the dosage. Mention this podcast and get 15% off your next order. Berkeley Yeast, ordinary yeast made extraordinary. 
let's let's talk a little bit about uh, you know hop flavor and mechanics in there too. You know, certainly the hops that you choose impact the the flavor and aroma, but they can also you know impact the the mechanics of the fermentation and uh, mouthfeel and, and some of these other pieces. Um, do, you, do you take that into consideration? Uh, you know, as you're building some of these recipes, you know, the way that especially you know maybe some of these southern hemisphere hops uh, you know can uh, can work in in ways that are a little bit different than uh, than others. Um, yeah, we, we definitely try to take the individual notes or characteristics of the hops, uh, and kind of, we try to make a blend where they pair well with each other. Um, but that goes all the way back to building the, the start of the beer too. Um, you know, if, you know, we kind of have the flavor profiles that we want and we kind of know which, which hops we have that, that will get that. And, you know, one of the issues too is just getting different varietals of hops, you'll get different notes. And then we also have to take that into account. And so, you know, sometimes when we get a new lot of something, uh, it's, well, we got to brew a beer and figure out how it tastes. And so, you know, you don't want to go all in on a new lot of hops for uh, a core beer that people have expectation of already. Um, our citron and mosaic have been super stable and very, very good. I've been really, really happy with those. And, um, so those haven't been too much of an issue that we had to mess with too much. Um, but I will say like, yeah, when we get new lots and every year is different for different varietals and we do, you know, we do a lot of different types of hops with IPAs. And so it's, uh, you know, we had a plan for a lot of that stuff, um, but I think we try to, we have something in our head and I think we usually get pretty close to what we want for the most part. So how does that work? Say so you get a new lot in, you, you know, just, uh, you know, find a way to work it into 10 or 20% of, uh, of a mix and try to see how that expresses there before it, uh, you know, becomes a, you know, 50 or 80%, uh, you know, citra mm -hmm. beer or something along those lines, you know, how, how does that look for you guys? Um, typically for like a newer one we probably wouldn't use more than a third of that in a hot pill um and it you know some hops too there's just certain characteristics of them it's where even 25 percent you may not even want to go because you may not want to yeah you may not want to go all in on on a you know cashmere or something like that if you don't know where that lot's going um but yeah we got a we have a pretty significant uh, amount of some like different varietals that have been kind of the same lot for for a little bit now and that's really helped us um, when we were spot buying when we first opened um, it was kind of a nightmare uh, but right now since you know we've been selling selling more and have a little bit more storage space and and whatnot it's been a little bit easier for us um, and so maintaining the same lots has really helped what are what are some of the more stable hops in terms of flavor year after year, and which uh, you know are there specific hop varieties where you see more variation? You know, is there there's some where you can just count on them, and others where you're like, I got to pay a little more attention to this. Uh, um, our Idaho Seven, Citra, Mosaic have all been really stable, really solid. Um, El Dorado's been pretty good. Every once in a while, you get kind of one batch that's a little more bell peppery or whatnot. Um, but that's been really good for us. Um, the hot vendors we're using, I think, have been pretty good at it. You know, we don't always get a due selection at our, our level. Um, and so the hot vendors we have have been pretty good at, at knowing kind of what we want and kind of, you know, pushing us to get the good stuff. Um, and, but yeah, I say, you know, our Nelson crops been pretty solid. That's been pretty stable for us. Um, Sabro and Strata have been kind of all over the board um, uh, from year to year. But I think this last year that we got was probably the best it's been. Yeah, we talk about thiols, sorry, you know, from a brewing perspective, but a consumer doesn't really want to think about those. They just understand flavors and the way that things convey. Some uh, Southern Hemisphere hops uh, while really intriguing and exciting to, to me, you know, I know there are plenty of people out there that uh, uh, they don't necessarily resonate in the same kind of way with. How do you all, you know, find ways to to mix those 
you know, together in a way that um, creates complementary and uh, interesting flavors without necessarily being polarizing. I think a lot of it is just uh, experience. Uh, we do a lot of one-off beers and we've done a lot of one-off IPAs. So we get to play with these hops a lot and brew with these hops a lot. So we know what to expect from a lot of these hops. And that's honestly what has helped us. Um, we know what, we, what we're going to get from our citra. We know what we're going to get from our mosaic. Um, and yeah, all these one-offs we brew really has helped us know what we're going to get from each hop variety and how to use those varieties. Are there ways that you like to use some of those, you know, Southern Hemisphere hops to, to kind of highlight and, uh, you know, bring out characters of other hops? So like in the Stink Stank Stunk beer, I know that's Citra, Mosaic, and Nelson. Uh, Citra, Mosaic, obviously, are some bangers. So in that beer, we just used a little bit of Nelson just to kind of accentuate, you know, just to give it a little something else. Um, I think that's kind of how we're using those beers. But then there's other times we're using those Southern Hemisphere hops, and they're the star. Uh, it, it depends on how you want the beer to turn out. Do you want them to be the star? Do you want them to have a background note? And it all de- it all depends on what your end goal is. Maybe we'll back out for a second. In terms of quality, what do you think? You know, some of the key quality differentiators are for you. Uh, I know this is a hard subject to try to you know wrap heads around, but you know, as our judges are tasting your beer amongst great beer made by brewers all across the country, very talented, skilled brewers everywhere, you know, yours are standing out to them. What do you think some of those key differentiators are for the way that you all make beer that helps push that perception of quality? Uh, Balance. I think that's a big thing we focus on is balance, not trying to go over the top one way or the other. You know, we want our sweetness dialed in. We want our bitterness dialed in. We're not trying to dump 10 pounds per barrel into the dry hop. It's just going to mess everything up and throw your balance off. Uh, I think in terms of quality, that's kind of one of the things we focus on with our hazy IPAs is balance, not trying to go over the top, just trying to keep everything in check. Grant, you have any thoughts on that? I mean, it even continues on to the process, even all the way to packaging. And so for us, um, we never really try to do anything the the easy way. It's always the best way. Um, you know, with us being a smaller brewery, we have, you know, we don't have a centrifuge or, or you know, some of the cool process equipment. And so we try to make do what we can with the space that we have. And, um, you know, the great thing about uh, having Pete as an owner, too, is that's, you know, quality is one of his biggest things, too. And we're kind of our own worst uh, critics, too. When we have something, we we tend to beat ourselves up if we don't like exactly where it is and whatnot. And, um, you know, for us, you know, we, you know, we we've been spending the money and the time to get you know, everything in line to make sure we're putting out good product. Um, You know, we'll even, you know, when we're packaging, you know, we won't package anything unless our DO numbers are good. So we got to dial those in, get those going. And we're not going to throw, throw labels or anything on this, these cans, if uh, it's not a good product. And so we're willing to, to, to bite the bullet and waste, waste some product or waste some time and do it the right way. And I think having a focus in that and really always being with that mindset has helped us um, make a more consistent product for for everybody. Pete, talk to me about that feedback loop process. I mean, as a business owner, it's hard to it's hard to make some of those business decisions, you know, but if you guys are, you know, how do you evaluate the success of these beers? And then how do you make notes on on moving forward and how do you make the decision, the hard decisions sometimes? to just not release something and, uh, you know, and start over again. You know, it's funny. Sometimes we all obviously taste together and uh, there's usually somebody in the group that doesn't like it. Right. So we're all looking at each other and trying to figure out, you know, what's the best. Um, So sometimes it's just simply by a vote. Um, Other times something unfortunate happens uh, this week 
we uh, lost, we had a, there was a gas leak in our building that had nothing to do with us. And we had mashed in and um, we had to dump everything. So you know, those, those are things that, you know, whether controlled by us or not controlled by us, we, we tend to have a chat about it. We are in really good communication about everything. And, um, you know, there's a lot of good beer out there too, you know? So we just want to make sure that we're putting our best foot forward anytime that we're packaging or anytime that we're marketing anything or, or, or brewing anything that we do, you know, we want to, we, we want our community to be proud of us. And we also want to put out a good product for the community as well. And that is great in principle. And it's a lot harder when you see dollars going down a drain. Okay. Well, we've talked about hazy IPA. We've talked about that quite a bit. Let's talk a little bit about another, you know, another style of beer that you all make quite a bit of, which is, uh, you know, tart fruit beers. And I, and I know you all call them sours. Maybe I think using this language of sours is maybe a little over overplaying the way that those things, uh, you know, are actually perceived and, and, uh, consumed by, uh, you know, by customers. Uh, I think it's something that we're all struggling on a broader industry level around. And, uh, you know, we tend to now call them tart fruit beers because that's really more what they are than, uh, you know, than sour, sour, you know, sour has such negative implications for some people. And these are really, they're acidic, but not any more acidic than the fruit itself is or the juice, uh, you know, that people might associate with these things. So let's talk about that. You know, you mentioned uh, earlier in the creative process that, you know, you taste other things, you bring some ideas around there. How do you then create these beers? You know, what is that process of creating acidity and, uh, you know, building a base that can support these kinds of fruit flavors. What does that look like for you all? There is, there's a lot to it. Um, our, our sour program has, has changed drastically and, and the years, um, we've kind of put ourselves into, um, uh, we've been making a lot of gluten-free, uh, base sour products more lately that it's kind of opened us up to a new market of consumers that, um, to be honest, when we first started doing it, it was real rough because um, the gluten-free people don't trust it right away. And um, it takes a while to, you know, even know that a brewery is making product like that versus, you know, they can know they can go to cideries or drink wine. Um, but, you know, just in our facility alone, you know, if we have wheat, you know, they're not going to trust it kind of thing. And, and so that took us quite a bit of time building that but kind of where we started was um you know we've done some wild sours but we really started doing a lot more kettle sours when we when we first were, were going and we built quite a few really fun brands off that uh just trying to figure out the right mix of you know how to get things to taste like kind of like muffins or or cobblers and whatnot and um you know, kind of, kind of figuring out the, the right amount of uh, cinnamon to give a hint of, of like a, a baked flavor, but you don't want a cinnamon bomb so that someone's like, oh, it's too much cinnamon. And so we've, we've made a lot of different beers and we haven't always hit the flavors we've wanted, but working off that past history, um, we can kind of figure out the right ingredients on where to get certain things. Even with fruit vendors, it's, it's all over the board on, you know, you know, you know, citrus fruit. I have one vendor that is the best citrus fruit and I always go to them. And then, you know, there's some, some other products, um, you know, we've been getting more away from the puree products because we add so much, it's hard to even get it to settle out sometimes. So we've been using more, more concentrates and with those processed concentrates, you also don't, get some of the flavors with some of the fruits um, and uh, cherries, I think are, are one of the best examples of that is you don't get to use cherry concentrate. You don't always get that like tanniny taste that I think is really pleasant. And I think it works really well with cherry based beers, but sometimes with cherry concentrates, it's almost more, I don't know, not quite Kool-Aidy, but just weaker maybe um, tasting. Um, and then how do you do, how do you go then and build back some of that depth to it? Um, so we kind of, we've been doing for some fruits, we just feel that you need puree or you need a blend of puree and concentrate to get the flavors right. you need. 
Um, and, you know, we just kind of bite the bullet, try to let it sit in the tank longer, try to drop out more of the puree. Um, or sometimes we want a lot of that puree and we'll spin the tanks while we're canning to try to get it evenly distributed into every single can um, kind of thing. We've been getting just away from that in general, just for um, consistency standpoint. And um, I think, at least in our market, I think the the not as thick stuff seems to seems to be doing all right. It's it's not a race to who can make the thickest beer anymore. I don't think, um, at least not for us. Um, but but yeah, I think um, biggest thing with those is is finding the product that has the flavor profile that you want for that beer. Uh, if we're using something that needs an accent of cherry, um, you know, I don't need to source a ton of cherries from one vendor if I'm not ordering anything else from that vendor. Um, and and so yeah, we've got probably. I don't know, four fruit, four plus fruit vendors we buy from for different fruits. And each fruit of theirs is kind of like our go-to for them. Um, and I think that's pretty, pretty well the start of where most of our, our sour start for a lot of the, the fruit based stuff. You mentioned, um, you know, making more beers for the non-gluten crowd. Now, this is a subject that is close to me. I'm one of my my youngest son is celiac and we're very focused on, uh, you know, on gluten consumption for that, that same reason. Uh, and what you mentioned is right. You know, if there's, if there's other, uh, if there's gluten containing ingredients in the brew house, uh, it can be hard to, you, it's hard to market something as gluten free if there's any of those ingredients around at all. Um, you know, but then building that kind of confidence, you know, is, is also important for the crowd. Um, how, what is that, process look like for you do you market these then as seltzers uh you know or is this like a for these non-gluten based you know tart fruit beers is you know is that a, do you call it that or do you are you using other kinds is this just a, a dextrose you know kind of sugar fermentation you know what what, are, what is this non-barley based and you know fermentation look like for those kinds of beers um like the biggest part of it is, uh, I guess we've been marketing them as the gluten-free sours um, um, for now. I mean, we'll probably always change marketing. That's, you know, what the um, the, the the nature of that, how that goes. But, um, uh, but yeah, it's uh, the hardest part is the, you know, you need a gluten-free yeast as well. Um, you can't just throw a lot of yeast in there because not all yeast is propagated and in, in a lot of it's propagated in, in beer bases. Um, right, right. And then with, you know, having something as gluten free, uh, I think the federal uh, minimum is, is, you know, 20 parts per million. Um, and I know for most people that are celiac, uh, that's not good enough. Um, right. And so um, we can get tests done as low as 10 parts per million. Um, but uh, essentially for us, uh, it is, it's a ton of cleaning. Um, it's items that don't get used for anything else, but, but, you know, gluten-free products. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's more of a process of cleaning than it is anything. Um, cause we have to, I think good cleaning practice in general are good. Um, but also with a lot of this product, you know, we're adding unfermented fruits as well. And so we also need it to not ferment as well. Um, yeah. And um, so there's a lot to yeah. that. It, we pasteurize and, and do a lot of stuff to maintain quality control. Um, but the, one of the biggest things with that is, is in just through our whole process in general, is just, uh, trying to maintain really strict, strict cleaning protocols and, um, quality controls and records of everything. How, at your scale, how do you pasteurize or do you, you have a inline pasteurizer? Do you do batch pasteurizing? How, how, how do you, how do you? hit that kind of stability in these without uh, allowing that fruit to referment? Um, so we have, a, for cans, a batch pasteurizer. 
Um, it uh, does not hold a lot, and it takes a lot of labor to load and unload. Um, it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, you even have to seam meters into the cans and load those and test those. You would think that, oh yeah, if I just run it for this heat for this long, uh, it'll be the same for every beer. And it is completely different for every beer. Um, really? And, yeah, even in our batch pasteurizer, there's different like hot zones where it won't get hit. It's hot. It sprays water down the top of the cans. And so we try to put the meter in essentially the worst spot where it doesn't get sprayed as well. And uh, so we know that's basically the, the lowest um, uh, reading of the PUs. And then so then when we're reading that, we know basically all the other cans are better. Um, but yeah, it's and even the start of a batch of beer, if it's a really, really, really thick beer, your pasteurization units um, uh, will be real low if you run it for the same time as like a thin beer. And even mm. if a beer seems thin and it's a high percentage of fruit juice, your P un units are still going to be pretty low if you don't run it for a good amount of time. So thickness, but it also gravity itself, uh, you know, has some significant mm -hmm. impacts on that. Oh, that's interesting. Um, from a, from a consumer perspective, you know, I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that this is moving towards a, a non-gluten base, you know, for, for these kinds of beers. It's something that I, I actually you know, had talked about and was, was thinking about, you know, two or two years ago, like, you know, I think there's probably this next outcome for this style of beer that doesn't need to have a full barley beer base because, I mean, that's not the point of those beverages, really. I mean, people are, are drinking them for the fruit flavor, and that's what they want out of them. Um, going, you know, through you know, creating a, a wart base for that that you're just going to try to, you know, strip out and minimize seems like, uh, you know, an exercise that, uh, you know, doesn't help the, the, the product itself. Um, so it's interesting to see that. But, I, uh, you know, does that – you know, from a consumer standpoint, Pete, like, do you find that it, uh, it just makes that more – Obviously, it makes it more accessible to people that might not, uh, you know, be you know consider themselves beer consumers. Um, but it also, you know, kind of creates an avenue for people to get into consuming at a brewery and uh, you know a product that they may not have, uh, you know, they may not have thought of a brewery as a a place for them, um, you know, before that kind of thing existed for them. Yeah, it's definitely taken on you know a journey for sure. I mean, our tap room. We started out with liquor and then we became a, a, a distributor, self-distributing. So we had to get rid of liquor. And so we could only do wine. And then we're just thinking about, we definitely have people who come in who do not say like, I do not like beer. And, you know, we kind of stumbled upon talking about doing these gluten-free sours and um, we started them and, you know, a lot of people like, what, like, what like for real these are you know gluten free and then went into the journey of kind of getting beaten up or you know is it really a, a beer and all those things and um beer nerds saying it you know you're not even really making beer but we kind of stuck to our guns and leaned into it and it's been something that has been amazing for us and um you know there's so many people that i talk to that come in and um, i've got close friends who are celiac and you know it just gives them opportunity to to enjoy the atmosphere and, you know, not be sitting in a chair and be like, I can't even enjoy this place because I can't have anything. So it's been really nice from that perspective. So we've, like I said, we've kind of leaned into it and that's something that we've been actually getting to, uh, pretty well known for. So it's been great. Obviously there's, there's lots of ways to look at this. I tend to, I tend to lean onto the side of, especially for breweries where the tap room or the brew pub is the focus that, uh, creating an environment that's more welcoming that lowers some barriers of entry and that makes people feel welcome, uh, no matter what, uh, you know, their own personal tastes or personal health background is, is, uh, is generally a good thing, you know, and that doesn't mean that everybody has to do that that way. There are some that want and need and have more focus in the things that they produce. Um, and that's great also. Um, you know, but it is a good thing in general, I think for craft beer, uh, to, to find people where they are and bring them in and, uh, you know, people will go on their own different craft beer journeys from that point 
But if you throw those barriers up from the very start, then it becomes a much less welcoming community for, for people in general. And, uh, and so it's a, I think that I like that approach of, of finding a way to make this an experience that more people can experience and uh, build positive vibes throughout all of this. Let's, uh, you know, let's talk about this kind of bigger picture for Barntown. What do you guys hope to achieve? You know, what do you, you know, if you're looking at, at the, uh, the business five years from now, you know, what do you, what do you think it's going to look like? What do you hope that it's going to look like? Uh, you know, and, and as you, you started this, you know, you, with every business, you come in with some idea of what you're going to be. And then the process of being in business shows you what your consumers want from you. And then you have to try to figure out where to go from there to, you know, to what it's going to turn into. You know, if you're looking at it now, six years in, what do you, what do you think the next five years have hold for you? Well, first of all, the first five or six years was surpassed every expectation for sure. Um, you know, moving forward, we, you know, we have, we have plans to expand. Um, we've been looking a lot at that, those kinds of things. And um, just, you know, it took me three years to figure out that I actually wanted to open the brewery. And so making moves is kind of a slow process for me anyway, but um, things are great. And like, for me, I just want to give these guys some more room to like do what they can. And like Cody had mentioned that, you know, during a day they're, they're waiting on water from another, someone's working on something, they got to wait to get something done. So just from a pure um, execution perspective, um, we, we need to expand and, you know, give ourselves some more room. Are there brewing challenges that you hope to, uh, to tackle here uh, beyond just some of the you know production mechanics? We have quite a setup of beers that we have coming out this year that'll be new. And then last year, we really kicked it up with a ton of new beers um, that we did smaller batches of that we didn't necessarily get to make as much as we wanted. So once you you know make a smaller batch and it's just gone in a week, you don't get a whole lot of people to try it. Um, so ramping those batches up and getting some more product out to more people is something I'm really excited about. I really enjoy making stuff that, that people enjoy. And so, you know, I don't always have to enjoy it myself. Uh, but if, if I'm making something that I'm happy with and other people are happy with, that's a, a win-win for us. And we've got quite a few beers that I'm pretty excited to make more of this year. And then I'm sure we'll think of a bunch of random off the wall stuff coming up here in a few months that, that we'll add to the list as well. Yeah, it's funny. We'll we'll make a beer that our pills are our lager that we're super stoked about, and it will just sit and sit and sit, and we'll make you know a gluten free fruit bomb, and it's gone in five days. And I came to the guys. I'm like, are you guys all right with this? Like, I mean, like I know that you came to, and you we all did this to brew, and like, and we're 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 doing this different thing now. I'm like, are you guys cool with that? I'm like, yeah. I mean, that's you know to Grant's point, they they we want to make things that people enjoy, and it's not always us having to drive the bus, you know what I mean? So if people are enjoying it and coming to the tap room and taking four packs home and we're selling in stores, then we're happy. That is a great place to bring this to a close. G&D Chillers has partnered with 3,000 plus breweries around the country and offers 24-7 service and support. TNS Hop Oils help you save on freight and reduce waste while improving beer quality. Try Old Orchard's flavored craft juice concentrate blends in your next craft beverage. AccuBrew is your set it and forget it solution to tracking every batch with no more samples. Pro Brews solutions are specifically designed to help you brew your beer. SS BrewTech has take, taken tech they invented working with industry vets and made it available to every craft brewer. PackTech handles are the sustainable solution to handle your craft beer and Berkeley yeast style boost is pure liquid thiol precursors that take tropics to the next level. If you've enjoyed this podcast and any others, please go to beerandbrewing.com, click on that subscribe button, show us that it matters to you. Um, Pete, if people want to learn more about Barntown, both in real life uh, and out there in the digital space, where do they find more about you? So online, we're at barntownbrewing.com. We're actually in West Des Moines, Iowa. So we're a little bit west of Des Moines. right on the board of Waukee and West Des Moines. So we like to call it West Des Waukee, but uh, online we're uh, Instagram um, and Twitter, Facebook, um, all ending Barntown Brewing. Fantastic. Well, uh, Pete, uh, Grant, Cody, thanks for joining me here on the podcast. It's been fun to talk to you guys about brewing. Cheers. Thanks.
Thanks so much for having us. I really Cheers. Appreciate Thanks for having us. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew.